And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at PreneurMarketing.com. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's show. Dom Goucher here with, as always, Pete Williams. Hey, Pete. Hey, mate. How's things? Pretty good. Pretty good. I've actually been back in Spain for a couple of weeks now. Not not jet-setting around so much at the moment, although about to start a pretty, pretty major contract with a client where I'll be traveling backwards and forwards, so uh, expect calls from foreign lands, as it were. <laughs> Very exciting, mate. Very yourself? exciting. Um, what's going on? A bit of a sick family this week and juggling that and trying to train for this Iron Man I've got in a couple of weeks' time, which I am so not ready for, so it's going to hurt like hell, but, you know, that's what you get. Well, I'm just going to change the subject because all that fitness stuff, you know me, I can't be doing with it. <laughs> uh, this week, folks, we're going to be talking about another of the seven levers. We're going to be talking about raising your average sale price. So watch out for that because some top tips, as always, from Pete and uh, hopefully a bit of a different perspective from me as well. So before we jump into that, let's talk about the the standard stuff. So other than family illness, which has been, I know, been a bit of a major thing for you this week, and I, I'm sorry to hear about that because I uh, love your family, love them to bits. Um, so I hope everybody gets better soon. What's been going on business-wise over there, projects oh, and business? Yeah, lots of, lots of good stuff. Just a couple of negotiations in the telco, which is interesting. And then uh, also just working on some, some major infrastructure changes with you um, in the preneur side of stuff. So... Exciting kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that's pretty major stuff, actually, isn't it? Yeah, it's taken a fair bit of time, a fair bit of planning, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about what it's going to give us and, and where we're going to go. So uh, it's one of those watch this space type of things. Yeah, I'm also going to insert the word pivot in there as well. <laughs> when, when, when we get to talk about this, when we when we get it got it all nailed down, it was it's definitely been a pivot for us, and it's a huge thing. But I think it's, it's one of those things that is going to just line everything up. Uh, so we're both very, very excited about mm. this. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Um, for me, I have, as I said, starting a new um, big, big undertaking for a new client. Uh, really excited about it. But I'm actually going to be getting involved at the kind of coal face. Mm. Um, and you know, this is all the whole the new things, all about consulting. It's all about not getting involved at the coal face. <laughs> um, so, so this is a big challenge for me to, to make sure I, I maintain that thing. And it's, it's a weird situation, but hopefully it's going to be a way of um, – maybe I can give some, some insight into it as I go through it, but a, a way of doing that thing that we talk about, and we talk about quite a few times, which is working on a business, not in a business. Mm. You know, As a consultant, I'm, I'm outside and above things to give that higher perspective, the strategy. But it's so easy to get sucked in to actually doing things, to delivering inside of, of the thing. And that's not actually, it's not helpful to me. And it's not in the, in the long run helpful to the client. You know, my job is to, if, if a skill needs to go into that, into that client, then they need to really get some knowledge transfer from me. I uh, get some training or whatever else, but I need to stay away from actually trying to do the thing, mm. even though I can. Yeah. Um, so a bit, a bit meta, a bit high level there, but, but, I think hopefully I can bring some examples of that in, in future shows um, just to really bring home that, that message that we do say a lot, which is, you know, work on your business, not in your business. Mm. So what about books? Have uh, you been reading or listening this week with your training for your Iron Man? Yeah, uh, I've been actually listening to some, some Iron Man related books, actually, a couple of books about um, well, an autobiography and then a biography about another athlete. So it's kind of been more, uh, yeah, motivation to kind of uh, keep me training. Yeah, it's a little bit meta, that isn't it? Listening to Iron Man books while you're doing your Iron Man training—it's it's a bit circular. Yeah, but it's uh, it's been good. Yeah, it's no, been I motivational. Could do that. It's just been helpful. Yeah, okay, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> um, I've actually been listening to work stuff. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> reading, listening to, came across this really cool book. And I'm sorry, sorry to geek out on this, guys, but but some I know this is a big issue, people. I know you know. Recently, you and Davey J have been um, Dave Jennings, your big pal, partner in crime elsewhere. Your other partner in crime. I've been working on your outsourcing. Yep. Course, and uh, a big part of that for me is actually describing the process for somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and I came, I finally came across this book. I have loads of examples of, of different ways of describing and documenting and diagramming processes, but they're very disparate and, and you know, they're all over the place and the internet's full of opinion and stuff like that. And I finally found this book called The Basics of Process Mapping mm. by a guy called Robert D'Amelio. Um, and it really is, it's just not, not, a, not a big thick book. It's like, you know, you want to you wanna draw up a process like this, use this kind of diagram, here's some tips to make it work out for you, away you go. Wow. Uh, brilliant. Anybody who's thinking of trying to map out, you know, whether it's map out your sales funnels for your seven levers, big, big process map you know, big important part of your business, or whether it's trying to do some training or handover for somebody on your team or trying to deal with an outsourcer, strongly recommend a quick look at this book um, to pick up the kind of the right kind of diagram for the right job and then the right way to do it. Um, and what really actually sucked me in and, and, and sold this one to me, and Pete, I don't know if you, if you use these at all, but I'm a big, big user of swim lane diagrams. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and yet, believe it or not, it's really hard to find a good reference to give somebody about how to do swim lane diagrams. Mm -hmm. uh, folks, very briefly, swim lane diagrams is a way of um, you break break things up into what they call swim lanes, like it's a swimming pool, and each lane is a person in the process. Yeah. So it's you, your outsourcer, the client, whatever it might be. And what you do is you put the job that somebody's doing in their column. And then you connect them together. So it's really clear from, from anybody looking at a diagram who's supposed to be doing what when. Yeah. So it's like a flowchart, but broken into who's doing it. There you go. Go read the book, basically, is what I'm saying, because it's got a great description of swim lane diagrams and lots of other process stuff. So sorry about the uh, the process diagram geekiness there, but I think it, it, it's one of the things that you and I have talked to a lot of people about when we talk to them about outsourcing is, is actually communicating mm. that process and documenting that process so top tip it is a bit of a and necessary evil it is sadly for those for those of uh, those people out there that aren't visual or don't have that experience so top top tip basics of process mapping robert d'amelio not a big thick book very easy very accessible and the other thing because i've been big on the old mindset recently just uh in the last uh, platinum call i was talking a lot about mindset because uh, mindset is a big part of business, especially for an entrepreneur. You know, you've got to have the right mindset. You know, you've got to get out of your own way. You've got to have the right perspective, and so on. Um, and through a most random, random connection, I came across a book called *The Chimp Paradox* by a chap called Dr. Stephen Peters. Um, and this is a really in-depth investigation to something that you may have heard about before. Um, which is this idea that we've got these different types of brain, all inside our brain, all at one time. There's different levels of our brain are reacting to different things. Mm -hmm. Some of it we can control, some of it we can't, because it's, it's hereditary, it's, it's evolutionary. Yeah, this idea that you have what some people call it the croc brain or the lizard brain, mm -hmm. and those different things. I don't know if you come across that. Yeah, well, I've, Seth Godin writes about it quite a bit. Yeah, uh, it's Seth also Godin mentioned that, uh, in Pitch Anything by Aaron Clark exactly. that we had on the show before. Exactly. So the croc brain comes from Aaron Claff, um, lizard brain is another one. But also you have, some people talk about this idea of the monkey mind, uh, which is which is a big thing for people who work, you know, if you're an entrepreneur or work on your own, self-employed, that kind of thing. This idea of, of something going, ooh, that's interesting over there. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You know. <laughs> uh, and, and stopping you from doing things and things like that. And it's, it's it, this book is, is, is all those topics. All those topics, it, it's just fascinating. Anybody who's interested in psychology, self-development, but anybody who has any problems with focus, um, motivation, uh, just determination, or anybody who feels not quite sure of themselves, problems with public speaking, you name it, pretty much every like psychological issue you possibly have is in this book. Interesting. Fascinating read. Fascinating read. I, 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 I go as far as to say, Pete, that I think we should get, if we can get Dr. Stephen on the show, we should. And focus him on a particular topic that's relevant to the audience. But, uh, you know, honestly, go read The Chimp Paradox mm. as well. There you go. So, been a busy, bit, bit of a busy week for me with books, but uh, good week. Good finds, those. Very pleased with those. Nice. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, enough, enough rambling and uh, esoterica. So, we get into our core content for this show. Let's talk pricing. Let's talk pricing. Let's talk. Let's do that thing that everybody is afraid of. 
Nobody wants to do anything with price. They are, nobody wants, don't likes pricing, do they? No, not at all. Everyone wants to seem it, it, to uh, play that race to the bottom. And, that, you know, it, it's easy to sort of drop your prices and just, uh, you know, oh, I'll drop my prices. That'll make more sales because it's an easy thing to do. But it's a very scary thing because you end up just racing to the bottom. It's whoever can do the thing the cheapest. And, you know, particularly in the digital world, that kind of has unique implications because if you're selling a digital product, whether it be a, a Kindle book or a training program or some software or anything that's digitally, digitally, I can't even say that word, delivered is, you know, the incremental cost to deliver that is virtually nothing. So you can easily justify to yourself that, oh, look, it doesn't cost me anything to, to deliver this. I'll, I'll sell it even cheaper. And that can be very, very uh, painful for your business's bottom line and the profits. I, you know, I don't, like, I'm just going to stop you there. Okay, because this this show is not about dropping your prices. This is this show is about increasing mm. your average sale price. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. So, like, folks, that's the end of talking about dropping your prices. <laughs> <laughs> this show is about increasing your average sale price. Okay, because this is this is a a big one of the seven levers. Not because it, it's something that you can have a big result. You know, every one of the seven levers, we're only looking for that ten percent increase. Mm. Um, the reason why this is a big one for me is it's, to me, it's the biggest sticking point that people can have in all the seven levers because we get all kinds of friction with this one, don't we, Pete? We yeah. get, we, we get, oh, well, I, I can't raise, I can't raise my prices or, or even if somebody's starting out, oh, I can't charge that much. Mm. Um, you know, things like that. And, and, and so I, that's really why, why this is a big one for me to, to talk people through this. Talk to uh, bring those issues out, you know, put them on the table, give them a good slapping, get rid of them. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the the big thing that people don't take the time to realise is that I refer to it as the your average item value, because obviously we're trying to in one of the other levers increase the amount of items we include in the transaction. So we're getting people to buy two, three, four items. We spoke about that recently on the show. So if you think about the mathematics of this for a moment, average item value, what that means is what is the average price of the products that the person has in their shopping cart, in their shopping trolley, however you want to refer to it. So you can increase that average item value by upselling to more expensive products in the transactions or sorry, the items per transaction lever. So in the earlier level, when we're trying to get people to buy additional items, if we make that additional item an increased price upsell, then what that does automatically, without doing anything really unique in this particular lever, just by default, your average item value will obviously increase. Yeah, see, I like that. I like that. Mm. Instead of or, or, instead of increasing the price of item A. Mm-hmm. What you do is, as part of the previous lever, you know, you you endeavour to sell the per- sell the customer something else. Just when you do endeavour to sell it to them, it's something that has a higher value. It's item B, mm. which has a higher value than item A. And the the basic maths of it is that item A plus item B divided by two, that's your average item value, and it's gone up. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely right. So you know there are some. More, more smarter, intelligent uh, ways to do this than simply just increasing your front end offer price point. So by actually thinking about, okay, what is this additional item, additional service I'm going to offer this person? You know, one of the big things that, that work exceptionally well if you're in a sort of information marketing or, or services business uh, is have your consulting or your product price. So whether it might be like an ebook or a home study course or even like a consulting session is what you sell where, you, where you're basically providing advice in return for, for revenue. That can be your front-end offering. A great way to help increase your items per transaction but more importantly, significantly increase the, the value of that is to actually offer a done-for-you service. So someone comes along and buys some, you know, marketing consulting services from you, Dom, for example. This is exactly what you're going through right now is they could have paid X for your consulting services, but um, whether you offered it or they kind of demanded it, that's debatable, I guess, you are now offering a done-for-you service where you're going in there to the coalface and doing extra work, but you are charging them a significantly higher price point, 
which obviously then overall increases your average item value for that client. Absolutely. That's in fact, you know what? <laughs> it's funny you should say that. I didn't even think about it in that way, but you're absolutely right. That's exactly what happened. Mm. I have some line item services that I go in and sell, um, and I do have, you know, here's, here's item A, and when you've completed item, when we've delivered item A, you'll probably want to think about item B, which has a higher price point. But they're still, you know, they're deliverables, they're, you know, consultancy services or whatever. But yeah, the, the thing, the situation I'm in right now is actually delivering exactly that, that done for you service. Mm. The, we've gone through the other, the other items that I, that I have as standard items. Um, and, They've said, "Hey, you know, you're quite a sharp guy, and we need that. We need to implement the suggestion changes you made. Can you do it? Yes, of course, you can. There you go. Mm. Um, and sometimes it is really that easy. I mean, that's a great. It's a great example uh, that you even highlighted that I didn't notice. But it applies in a lot of those cases where you're offering basic services or basic consultancy, or that that you can do that. So that's a really good one. Mm. And I think the third sort of." a uh, way to increase your average items that people don't think about that, again, isn't just increasing your sales price, is actually the sort of, again, what we spoke about in, in a recent episode when we spoke about the uh, the, trend, the items per transaction lever and the different types of upsells and cross-sells and add-ons and stuff is just in your sales process, offering the person the more advanced version of the product or solution once they've already made a micro-commitment. And what I mean by that is the person's already fundamentally said, yes, I'm going to go and buy product A. And then as soon as they sort of show that um, agreement and forward planning, start to say, okay, hang on. Now, you have agreed for this. Let's now consider a higher quality product. So not a second product. It's a higher quality product. So someone comes into your retail store to buy a lawnmower for example, and you sell them a very basic lawnmower and they agree to say, yep, this is, I'm happy with this. But then what you start doing is you start asking them probing questions to figure out, oh, they'd be better off getting a lawnmower with a mulcher attached to it. And then you can transition them from that original agreed purchase to a higher price product. So you're not actually increasing the, the cost of the, the basic lawnmower by any stretch of the imagination. It's still a standard price point. But what you're trying to do then is just increase the person to go, hang on, how about buying this more expensive item with better benefits and better uh, facilities and functionality and things like that? So it's a way to actually not add an additional item to the cart yet. That's a, a different conversation, a different lever. But it's just about migrating that person from you know level A to level B in the, the product range. Does that make sense? Yeah, can I just I just want to clarify that one because the, we, we did go from, hey, sell them something else then the average is higher. higher. Um, so we've had we've had sell two things instead of one, but the second thing is of a higher value. Yep. Which overall increases the average. Yeah. Correct. Because the actual the actual lever is average item value. So average being the key word there. Then we had make sure that you've got something of higher value to sell them. And a good example of that would be a done for you service, which is quite literally of higher value. It's not just something you can put a higher ticket on yourself, but it's literally of higher value to the client, which mm. I think is something we should come back to. Yeah. Yeah. So let's have something that there is, and then you can progress people through, you know, go, you've done A, you've, you've got A, you've got B, you probably now want C. Mm. Um, and you use my, my consulting as an example of that. Um, and then we have the third one, which is, again, it is related because it's have something of higher value that you can offer. But in that example, you use consultative selling. Mm. Yeah? Absolutely. Where you, at the point where they say, hey, you know, okay, right, I want to buy a lawnmower, I want to buy this one. You go, okay, can I just talk to you about your needs? Can I understand the situation? Yeah, okay. Probably this other thing is going to be better for you. Yeah, it's... Yeah, you know, slightly more than you'd originally decided you were going to pay, but it will meet your needs. 
So that, and that's using that thing. We do talk about that quite a lot, the idea of consultative selling, talking to somebody, understanding their needs, and genuinely offering, and again, it's this value word, genuinely offering them something that meets their needs by listening to them and responding to that, what you hear, and offering them that thing. And that, that again, is a form of value to them. Mm. Yeah, because all these things are value exchanges, right? Yeah, it's all, everything yeah. in business is a value exchange. Yeah, and um, we a lot of people just equate value to money. Mm-hmm. It's like you know because as the business person, money is our measure of how much the customer values what we're giving them, right? Yep. But what the customer doesn't measure it that way. A lot of people do think that, and that's where a lot of this pr- friction on pricing things come from. Really, is that the customer? They people think the customer just looks at the number and goes, "That number's too high." Well, when they when they actually look at the number, what the customer is doing is saying, "Am I getting value? Mm. Am I getting sufficient value for the number I'm handing over?" Yeah, yep. they have to evaluate, it. and it's not it's not just a number. It really is. It can be. Will this solve my problem? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think a lot. Basically, you know, the some of the last couple of those examples that we gave were about making sure that the thing that you offer solves the problem the person has, whether it's the fact they're time poor or they don't have the skills for themselves to implement, so the done-for-you service fits that scenario. Yeah. Or the consultative selling with the lawnmower, where it's the right job, right tool for the job. Mm. And, and this is, yeah. this is the, the interesting thing is I think those two or three examples and, and, and ways to increase your average item price – uh, are things people often overlook or forget and they go straight to increasing their prices. And this is the thing is like yes. when we consult with a company and help them implement those seven levers uh, in their business and, and get that growth, that's where we go first. We don't say just jack up your prices. We go to these other ways first because they are more powerful uh, and they, they they give you a much better, um, I guess, opportunity to, to increase those average item prices, sort of, I guess what I'm trying to say there. It, it, it's a win-win situation in my mind, mm. and it is why we do do that, because from a client point of view, the, the value is, becomes more apparent. You know, the consultative selling approach, people feel listened to, they feel that they've definitely got the right tool for the job, or you know, offering the done for you service. Again, people really feel that the pressure has been lifted. So you're you're suggesting things to somebody if they want to improve their, you know, go through seven levers in their business, you're suggesting things that are immediately obviously to the client to, to their their customers valuable things. But from our client, you know, when we're consulting to people on seven levers, it overcomes a lot of friction. Mm. Because going in and telling somebody raise your prices isn't helpful. In some in some cases, people are against it for whatever reason. There's friction. There's difficulty. There's challenges. There's you know the chimp paradox comes in. <laughs> believe it or not, you know fear things like that. Yeah. I can't do that. Who will think? But what they think, and so by offering this this alternate route, oh you know have a higher value product. Mm. Oh, I could do that. Oh, yes. Oh, oh well, 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 we can do good. Well, of course we can do done for you services. There you go then. Yeah, exactly. No, it, it just reduces that friction. So it's a win-win. Mm. So, so moving forward in terms of the, the next level of uh, strategy or tactic that we, we try and implement with someone when they're, we're going through this process is to look at, okay, how can we not sell a different product but add to the original product at a higher price point? So someone can buy, you know, product A at price A, or they can buy, you know, A squared at price B. And what I mean by that is product A with a whole bunch of additional bonuses and benefits at a higher price point. So we're not trying to sell them a separate option or a separate product. We're just trying to, I guess, option the product up. And if you're looking at the the car industry, enhance, beautiful word. So, you know, and the best way to do that is by, you know, offering air. And what I mean by that is, okay, let's say someone comes along and wants to buy a product from your business and you offer that product in its standard form for $100. That's what the item cost is, $100. Well, how can you add on to that product to give people the opportunity to pay $120 for that product? Let's say it's a microwave as an example. So you've got $100 for a microwave 
you know, I don't know if that's cheap or expensive, but your microwave is 100 bucks. What can you offer with that microwave as an alternative option for that client that allows you to charge $120? Well, maybe you can offer an extended warranty. So the warranty comes with the, the uh, microwave for 12 months. Well, can you offer a two or three year warranty with the product? Can you offer a ebook or even a printed book full of menus and tips on how to use the microwave? You know, can you offer a uh, apron that comes with the microwave? That you then for you have this option of saying, well, you have pay hundred dollars for the microwave, or you spend one hundred and twenty dollars and get all this additional value at a very cheap price point. You know, it doesn't cost you twenty dollars out of pocket to better you know, offer a warranty or to offer a uh, uh, a series of eBooks or a video series on how to best cook with the microwave. Uh, and the beautiful thing about offering digital delivered services. If you are selling a physical product, and I know we have quite a bit of an audience who own that physical retail world, by offering a bonus that's digitally delivered, it forces the client to give you their contact details Ooh, that you can then sneaky. use to increase the lever that is transactions per period because you have to get their email address to be able to deliver them that digital ebook cookbook or that digital cooking video series. Uh, and in that way, you have their email details that you can then use to contact them after the fact to buy other stuff with you uh, in the future. So that's kind of a very subtle way to tie some of these levers together as well. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pull pull apart what you just talked about because there was kind of three different things in there. <laughs> Um, all of them perfectly good ideas, but just to clarify, because you opened up by saying um, adding adding air mm -hmm. um, and the adding adding air is is this concept of things that don't necessarily cost you money but appear to or genuinely do add value absolutely right so an example you gave was maybe warranties insurance policies that kind of thing um, and those are things that you know if you do have to make good on them then they cost you money mm -hmm. um but in general, they don't. They certainly don't cost you anything to to offer. No, absolutely. Um, not. You don't have to implement anything particularly, put anything in place, or anything like that. You don't have to manufacture or buy anything in. So that's where you were talking about the 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 adding air mm -hmm. part of that. So that's a great way. You know, it's 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 not technically making the the actual object have a higher price, but the 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 composite sale of that object plus the extra whateverness is higher so the average item value is higher so that's that's one thing that you said the other thing is absolutely the most basic fundamental thing you can do which is to go and find something else that you can bring in where you can at least maintain your margin another lever there for you to talk about at some point so bring in a thing and add it to the to the packaged item. So you gave examples of cookbooks, which is a great one, or utensils, or aprons, cooking aprons, just keeping with that cooking model idea. All these things that you can bring in, they don't cost you that much money, but they, they literally do add genuine value to the object. So people say, hey, you know, I'll pay $120 because this one comes with a free squiggle. Mm -hmm. You know, and honestly, folks, look around any any kind of white goods, home appliance thing. You're going to see this. Look for any food processing tool, any kind of thing like that, and it'll say free thingy. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a food person, but there will be a thingy in there. I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, a thingy or a doohickey there or a go. widget. Yep, that does something like I don't know, silicon scraper to clean out your your uh, your juicer. There you go. Yeah. Yep, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's an example of that where you put it, something that goes in the box, and suddenly people go, "Oh yeah, well you know, yeah, that one's ten dollars more than that one, but you get this free thing with it. And it's really useful." Mm. So you, you've 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 added that thing in, and it becomes part of the box, part of the sale, so average item price. And the final point you made, and I this is there was a couple of the two things composite into one on that one was you, you transitioned the idea of the cookbook to maybe a a digital download 
Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned at the beginning, one of the great things about digital downloads is the cost of delivery is basically zero. Yeah. Yes, you have the cost of production, but unlike a physical object, so if you take digital book versus physical book, the digital book production cost stops when you finish writing. Mm. Yeah. Whereas a physical printed book, well, you still have to pay for it to be printed each time, whether it's print on demand or you, you bulk buy a big print run to get it cheap, whatever, it's still going to cost you money every time you want one. Mm-hmm. Whereas, so the production and, and delivery side of things are separate with the, with the digital. So you've got this massive reduction in delivery cost, which means that it becomes close to air, our first point, in terms of adding the value to the product. Hey, you know, get a token for a free download of... You know, you'll get your code inside the box for the free download of 100 recipes to use with your juicing thing, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a great tip, a great way of adding value to an object, an item for sale, without costing yourself a lot of money, which is merging two things together. But I love that extra tip you gave. A really good one, that, that talking to another lever, which is repeat transactions, transactions per period, in order to get repeat transactions from somebody, in order to increase your number of transactions per period, you need to be able to contact them. Mm. You need to be able to draw them back into the store. And ideally, you need to be able, one of those, this, this is what a very fundamental thing. In fact, Pete, you and I were talking about this earlier on today. One of the fundamental things about the seven levers that overarches everything we talk about is measurement. Mm-hmm. And ideally, you want to know that some that the person that came last week came again in six you know will come again in six months' time when they turn up, you want to be able to notice it was them and measure it and keep an eye on it so this idea that they buy an item from you and you offer them a digital download when they sign up for it they 're tripping a flag that says they bought something, this is me, I bought this thing. Mm-hmm. And you also then get that contact data, as you said, to be able to contact them and offer them new offers, new products, you know, just bring them back into your store, just offer them another thing to buy later on and increase those transactions. So that is a bit of a mega tip. Hmm. Very cool. So... I've got some more things, more uh, ideas that I'll throw out there as well for this episode. Is cool if you're a digital um, product supplier, so you're an information marketer, you sell you know digital courses, you sell software, that kind of stuff. A really good strategy that I've seen is, I think for a lot of people, the issue is I don't have the resources, time, or effort to create more free content or more bonus content. You know, the the effort to get my core product completed was enough of a nightmare. You know, I think for a lot of people, like getting that first product in its basic form ready for sale is enough, and that's completely yep. understandable. And you offer that yep. right now. In for, my previous guys, I can definitely attest to that. Yeah, so you sell it for forty seven dollars, ninety seven dollars, whatever it might be, and that's that's the product. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Something I've seen work exceptionally well, which actually then also helps drive joint venture partner opportunities. So again, there's some leverage on this idea. It doesn't doesn't just fit or fix the one problem I'm about to mention, but it also gives you additional benefits, which will come clear in a moment, is what you do is you reach out to other people in that same space and you say to them, hey, Scott, I noticed you also operate in the underwater kickboxing training space. I've got this product I'm selling and marketing. What do you have that... You know, you currently sell for seven dollars, or give away for free, or or sell for fifty dollars, whatever it might be. That you'd be willing to give me for free, that I add on as a bonus to the premium version of my product. So someone can spend forty-seven dollars right now and buy my personal course, or they can spend fifty-seven dollars, sixty-seven dollars, you know, fifty-one dollars, you know. Just 10% more because, again, all we're trying to do is increase our price by 10%. So you go from $47 to you know, $52, you know, just slightly higher than a 10% increase. So for $52, they get the core product plus they get Scott's amazing 
tips on how to breathe underwater when you kickboxing program or ebook. And then you reach out to Julie, and Julie gives you a ebook that she's written in that space already that she uses as her sort of lead generation piece that then uh, shows you how to stretch before you start underwater kickboxing to make sure you get a greater reach. Like I'm making all this sort of crap up, I'm sure people understand, but it's a very easy way to then say, hey, Julie and Scott, you're getting content from them for free. You're adding it to your Mm. product, which didn't take any more effort, time, or struggle on your behalf. It Mm. gives the person who's going to be a buyer to say, look, I can spend $47 for, you know, product A or $52, an extra 10%, a measly extra 10%, and buy the premium package, which has these other additional bonuses that are from other experts as well. So it shows it's a very holistic course. So... That's a great way. So on your, on your sales page, you have the two offers, offer one or offer two, which is the premium version. But then also because Julie's involved in that product, she's got some, some sort of investment, so to speak, by offering her product on that sales page. Then you can turn around to Julie and go, hey, how about we now do a joint venture promotion to your list to promote my product? Because you've already sort of shown her value first by saying, hey, I want to expose you and your product to all my buyers. Like how great is that for Julie and Scott to say, hey, I'm going to expose you to people who buy stuff in this niche. They're going to then devour your free content and then go and buy stuff from you in the future. So it's a huge win for them. It's a huge win for you on the front end by increasing your average item price. But then also you can then use that relationship that's been built there off providing value to Julie and Scott first to then say, hey, how about we now do a joint venture promotion? So you're getting, again, a couple of birds with one stone. Okay, pretty cool because, that, that, as you say, that's, that's adding literally adding value to your product, therefore giving you an easy way internally to say, I can increase the price because it's worth more because there's more in it. Mm-hmm. It, it is a, quite a digital Example. Absolutely. You know, it's, emo, it's most easily done we're in the digital space where people are building information products, ebooks, and things like that. I'm sure if you thought about it, you could apply this in different scenarios, mm-hmm. but it's definitely easier when you're just moving bits of, literally, bits, bits and bytes around. Mm. Um, but yeah, by, by building that relationship, by saying, hey, you know, you give me, you give me something to include in my product and you get the credit. I'm going to tell everybody about you. They're going to read your stuff and go, hey, you're cool. Um, and you're basically giving them or offering them the chance at traffic, um, focused targeted traffic coming from your list. Um, and at the same time, because you're building a relationship, then you're increasing your opportunities to go and get some traffic for yourself mm. because you can then offer that product um, on whatever basis you know, you might need to do a deal about the revenues and things like that. Um, but you can offer that product back into their list, which is a traffic source you didn't have. Mm. I, I really do think that the biggest takeaway um, that people should get from this episode, I think, as a minimum, is working out how every single product in your product line, so every sort of front-end product that you sell, should have a premium solution attached to it. So you have Ooh. product A plus a, plus a premium version that is only 10 to 15% more. Because for most people, if you can show an additional 20 or 30% in value, however that's perceived, but only charge 10% for it, you'll be amazed at how many people actually end up taking that offer. That if you think about it, last time you bought a course, you know, most people who listen to this podcast probably invest in information products. Whether they they sell it and do it as their own business, that's another thing. But you at least invest in education to grow your business in books and ebooks and training programs. Think about the last time you went and invested $47 in something. If there was an if there was an offer on that sales page that said, hey, $47 for the core product, or for $52, you get this version with additional stuff. Or it was $97 and $110. Or it was one, you know, $497 or 547, just that 10% extra increase. Of course, most cases you would have gone, do you know what? I've already committed mentally to spend 47 bucks. Why not spend 55 bucks to get this additional stuff? Because, you know, all you're then saying mentally is going, hey, all I'm spending an extra $5 here to get all this extra value. It's a $5 sale in that sort of mental aspect of it. 
And it's such an easy thing to think about from your own perspective that, of course, I would have done that. You know, if you're going, going into a retail store to buy some footwear and, you know, you have the running shoe for 120 bucks on the shelf, but then also it's like, hey, for $135, you can also get a pair of socks, um, this ebook on running tips and, you know, a pair of laces or whatever it might be that you can, you can factor in that gives you that additional profit. That you, is such an easy, subtle upsell that most people will take without any pressure from you, the salesperson, having to make. Do you know the weird thing about this show? What? That's the second time in the same show that you've said something and I've thought, why aren't I doing that with my business? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or, or, oh, yeah, I realized that that was me doing it unconsciously. In this case, it is, why aren't I doing that with my business? I'm literally, while you were talking then, thinking to myself, yeah, you know what? Those standard items that I've got, the things that we, we go in with, you know, in a box, order this kind of thing, yeah. Why can't I do a premium version of that? Why can't I add a, an extra item that increases the value, perceived value to the client? Mm. I think the biggest thing, though, that I really want to reinforce, I think a lot of people kind of on the surface have an understanding of, oh, yeah, premium products. I should be offering a premium version of everything. They're kind of aware of that. It's a very basic business 101 kind of idea. But I guess the biggest thing I really want to just repeat to really hammer home is that when you're looking at running your business through the, the foundation and framework, these are seven levers which is probably the most powerful business framework there is on the planet. And it, it's really... In your humble opinion. Well, absolutely. I'm, you know, <laughs> hey, if I don't believe it, who will? Um, hey, it's, hey, look, it's based on math. You can't argue with it. That's the thing. Exactly. And the thing yeah. is, all we're trying to do is increase each, each lever by around about 10% to then obviously yeah. have that doubling of the profit of the business. So when you are looking you at offering a premium package... Most people, when they think offering a premium package, they think making it 50, 60, 200% more expensive. Yeah. So the premium is a significant yeah. jump and that gets yeah. scary to create and scary to offer. But realistically, yeah. all we're trying to do here with our premium offer is make it 10% more expensive. So it's very easy to deliver from a production perspective. You know, you don't have to get scared by what's required to offer something that's only 10% more expensive. But also, too, 10% more expensive is such an easy sale to make or an easy purchasing decision to make from the buyer's perspective. So you actually will find more people will take that 10% increased premium than overall than it would be if you offered a option that was 200% more expensive and had less take-up. Overall, you are going yep. to get a much better result, which is obviously, at the end of the day, going to drive more bottom line profit to your business, which is what the seven levers and business in general is all about. Definitely a point worth reinforcing and highlighting. I, I really, really agree with that wholeheartedly, that people are going all the time. In, in any case, they're all going for the you know, 50, 100% increases. And probably this is one of the best places to focus on the 10%. Because it's a, it is, as you say, an easy 10%. If you can sell something at a price, you can sell something that is worth more for 10% more. Mm. Yeah? Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's a great takeaway from this. I think it's a great takeaway from this show. Okay, mate. Look, we are getting towards where we would normally kind of close things down. We've probably got a few more things, but I want to make sure that we absolutely just – Get hold of the elephant in the room and give it a good slapping. Okay. And that is actually charging enough for your price for what you're selling mm. or increasing the prices. Yep. Those two big friction points. Mm. Now have we got some quick takeaways for people for either char believing in, in yourself or whatever, charging enough for something, or Increasing the prices and justifying that. Sure. I think from, from a front-end perspective is that I would highly argue that anyone listening to this show is the most expensive in their space. You know, obviously, there is only going to be one person in every space that is the most expensive. Uh, so, obviously, based on mathematics, again, the chance of that person listening to the show and being you is pretty slim. 
So there's definitely price elasticity in your market right now. And what that means is that there people are more elastic. There's, there's more of a, a spring or more movement in pricing than you probably already give it. So just by simply increasing your prices, it's not going to make you the most expensive in your space, generally speaking, for most people listening to the show. So there's going to be that price elasticity where you can increase 10% and still won't be the most expensive and still be able to make a significant amount of sales. So that's sort of a very high-level first uh, element. That's a good perspective. There's, yeah, there, you're, not, you're not the most expensive, and even if you put your price up, you still won't be, so why not? Yep. The second thing good is, one. is as you work through, which I kind of touched on this earlier, but as you work through the seven levers of your business, not only does everything increase by 10%, and at the end of the day, your profits double, which is just a beautiful thing, but your perception in the marketplace, your positioning, your offering, everything improves exponentially. So, you know, if you have a much better traffic source, which gives you much better qualified, you know, prospects, then you have a much better opt-in experience where you have, you know, testimonials and guarantees and great delivery in your opt-in scenario, however you, however you structure that. You know, maybe you have a retail store, which we've spoken about before, and you have a beautiful experience a person has when they come into the store before they sit down and try on a pair of shoes or, or check out that dress or take a demo of the vacuum cleaner. And then you have a fantastic conversion experience in the, how you sell the person, how you offer the person the experience, how you deliver it, all that sort of conversion engine related stuff. You know, that's going to give a much better experience for your customer than anywhere else. So just by increasing those first two or three levers, the perception and experience for that client is so much better that you can naturally, just as a byproduct, charge at least 10% more, just purely because the experience in the first two or three levers has been a wow factor. It's been a magic moment, if you will, for that prospect, that they're going to just subsequently pay that little bit extra. Think about when you go to a restaurant. You know, at the end of the day, you go to a restaurant to nourish yourself and give yourself food so, you, you know, you're, you know, fueled for the next day. But if you go to, to, you know, a McDonald's, the experience there when you sort of walk in, you know, into the store and get served and how the food's delivered on a plastic tray in pieces of cardboard, that's, that, that's their opt-in and conversion engine. It's like you have to walk to the, to the, to the, to the server, you have to tell them what you want, you have to pay them straight away, that's the opt-in scenario, then the conversion engine in terms of the experience there is, hey, here's your food in pieces of paper and cardboard on a piece of plastic, and then you go and consume it. Now, at the end of the day, you're consuming food. Now, let's say you go to a, a, a much more elegant restaurant where you are welcomed by a doorman, you are taken to your seat, you are given a napkin over your lap, you are poured water. This is all your opt-in experience. This is just the, the getting into having been ordered yet. Then the waiter comes to you. He takes your order. They go away. They come back. They serve you the food on beautiful plates with nice cutlery, and they fill up your water um, numerous times. Like that's the experience you get. At the end of the day, you are still consuming food to be nourished, but you're willing to pay substantially better money, even if the food at the end of the day is kind of potentially subpar or on par with McDonald's, you know, you get all you get is a hamburger and fries. Like I went to a restaurant last Friday night with Floyd, we had a date night, and we went to a burger place and we got a burger and fries. And it was great. We would have paid five or six times what we would have if we went to Macca's. And yes, you can argue that it's a better burger, of course, but was it five or six times better? Probably not. But the reason we, we happily paid more and they were able to charge more is because everything leading up to the actual exchange of money was a better experience. So this is the thing too, is as you work through your business and focus on these seven levers and rinse and repeat and go through the cycle over and over again, subsequently with that, everything in your business uh, increases, the experience, the service, the product, everything just increases that absolutely lets you easily without question increase your price by 10%. I think it's a really good point to highlight. Yes, absolutely. The, the 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 seven levers is not just about the face value ten percent increase. It's about the other things that your business will benefit from because you've just gone and done them. Mm. And I think I think you. I mean, the list there was a, was extensive, but it wasn't even close to what will actually happen. Mm. 
you know, and and so it's a great example. I love the parallel between the two burger joints, as it were. Um, and I think that that is it's a great perspective for people to bear in mind that you're by going through this, you're generating the very thing that will not just make you make it reasonable for you to introduce the price, but maybe even make you believe more that you should. Mm. You know, you look around at the, envi- the, the, the environment that you're creating, the experience you're creating for your customers, and and go, yeah, you know what, we're worth more. Yeah, um, I'm worth it, as they say. You know, to to build on that and to to just kind of step slightly to the side, uh, but but to carry on with this idea of of things that happen or don't. One thing that what I was really made painfully aware of recently while I've been working in the consulting space, um, and this is absolutely applicable to pretty much anybody, is always remember, and it's an awareness thing, it's like the awareness of what goes on with the seven levers, always remember that very few people realize what it takes to deliver the thing you've just given them. Mm-hmm. whether it's a service, a product, whatever it is. Very few people realize that. And also, it's very easy for people to not actually realize some of the things that you've done mm-hmm. for them as part of the service. You know, Let's go completely off, off, off from burger joints. Let's go to um, garden maintenance. Mm-hmm. And I think Pete, you know, you talked a couple of times about garden maintenance. You know, it's 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 one of those completely different business. We've talked about all kinds of businesses today in, in today's show. So garden maintenance, physical work, you know. Um but and and you might charge a premium. And at the end of the day, if somebody looks out their window and they asked you to cut down a tree, and when they looked out the window in the morning the tree was there, and when they looked out the window in the afternoon the tree's not there then on face value, you and the guy that's cheaper than you did the same job, Mm -hmm. right? But the reality of it is if you offer even just a better service, let's let's not even talk about the premium service yet, but if you offer the better service, you might do things like um, make sure you take the wood away from the tree you chop down, Mm -hmm. yeah? Um, you may even make sure that the the wood goes to a good place where good things happen to it. I don't know, recycling, for example. Yeah. You know, it may be used in some kind of rep- reclamation thing. Then your customers may be interested in that and find that a valuable thing. But if you don't tell them, and this is my point, if you don't tell your customers the things that you do for what for what they you know what's in it for them, and this could be physical goods. If you don't tell them the extra items in the box, they don't see that extra money as being worth spending. Mm. Sometimes, you know, you may even they may need to even explain why it's valuable. You know, this is a silicon scraper. So what? Well, because it's easier to clean out those little corners of the uh, juicing thing with a silicon scraper than it is with a wooden one. You know. Mm. Um, it's about describing that thing. It's about telling them what you're giving them. I saw this with a service provider recently. The client was looking at the bill they'd got, and they said, uh, that's a big bill. Mm-hmm. And that was literally, that was a conversation. It was, uh, that's a big bill. And the service provider kind of went, shrug. <laughs> but the reality of it was, when you actually drill down into it, the service provider was providing... All the things that they based that, that they were expected to provide, but they were actually providing much, much more. They were doing some really cool things. They were being really proactive. They were delivering into the client and helping the client out. The client wasn't even aware of what was being done. Yeah, and they just hadn't bothered to tell them. Mm. And the response wasn't, "Ooh, what a lot I'm getting for the money." It was, "That's a big bill." Mm. Perception is reality. Yeah. Perception, perception is reality. There you go. You know. And, and and so that is, I think, I think that's a big thing in in dealing with that pricing thing. You know, if you go, oh, you know, people won't pay that or whatever. Well, the only reason people won't pay it is because they don't see the value. Mm. It's quite simple that. To me, it's quite simply that. Absolutely. Cool. Very cool. All right, f- folks. So, you know, that's our core topic for, for this show is – Increasing your average item value. Some great takeaways. Love, you know, Pete, you get, you get some great takeaways there. Um, and, and it is, again, you know, I'm coming at this from the mindset point of view. I'm in a bit of a mindset mode. But 
thinking about things slightly differently with this is the way around it. And I think we've gone through all the examples we gave are all about thinking about it differently. Mm. Um, and, and you know that's how we that's how we help people when we when we work with people on their own businesses we get them to think about it differently so I think that's the the key he, here absolutely I love it so moving on next week um, we've got a great conversation with uh, Toby Jenkins who's author of Web Marketing That Works which is a great new book um, on a whole different ways of uh, you know growing a business online and uh, you know these guys run one of Australia's biggest and best web agencies so they obviously you know are in the trenches every day and know what's going on with a whole range of clients and a whole range of spaces which is very exciting so it's going to be a very cool conversation with him cool and then always you know there's the blog preneurmarketing.com uh you know every week we choose the best comment um from the the blog that people you know leave on any show whether it's this particular show or a post that's from this week or from months ago uh, and we send them a copy a signed personal copy of my first book, the infomercial-esque titled How to Turn Your Million Dollar Idea into a Reality. So if you are interested in getting a free copy of my physical book in the mail, hand-signed by me, head over to the blog, leave a comment about you know what you loved about this particular episode, what are the things you've implemented or going to implement or the biggest aha moment or whether it's you know a previous episode or obviously a, uh, one of the various posts we have on there. Contribute to the community and you'll get uh, handsomely rewarded. And as a side effect of us looking into our infrastructure stuff, folks, I'm just going to let, let you out here, um, we're looking at, not that Pete's book isn't awesome and isn't incentive enough for you to leave us a comment, but we are looking at other things that we might start sending you. So, in addition to just being a good old member of the community and dropping us a comment, letting us know how we're doing and things like that, there's the, that added incentive of that little competition that we run. So do please pop over to Preneur Marketing. As Pete, as Pete says, there's every episode of this show available for download, all of the show notes, links to things we talk about, transcripts, everything there, as well as all those awesome articles that Pete's having done and uploaded onto the site recently. You know, There's some great in-depth stuff to read over at PreneurMarketing.com. So do join in and have a look there. Is that it for this week, Pete? Should we wrap it up there and put a little bow on it? I think we should. Let's uh, let's say goodbye to the folks. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you on the blog at preneurmarketing.com. Otherwise, we will speak to you in our next Preneurcast episode. See you soon, folks. You've been enjoying another fine episode of Preneurcast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.preneurmarketing.com or drop them a line via Preneurcast at preneurgroup.com.